Now this is my first time making a life of a biography video so it might be a little bit wonky. We'll find out together. This video also has a few goals. The first goal, no surprise here, is to explain the life of Abdullah Azam and how he came to the conclusions he came to. Number two is also to explain the early stages of the international pan-Islamist and international jihadist sentiment and elements that we see today. Abdullah Azam would play a very huge role in this. And which is kind of rare in many cases, is loved by almost every type of jihadist and armed Islamist. Abdullah Azam would be born on November 14th, 1941 in the Palestinian village of El Silah El Harathiya in the West Bank. Abdullah Azam would be born into a farming family. Abdullah Azam during his childhood was seen as a well-mannered kid that spent a lot of his days reading books and in one case impressing his headmaster at his boarding school so much that he was able to go to school for free. And this would seem like a pretty solid childhood. Some of you might have forgot something though. I said Abdullah Azam was born in Palestine in 1941. And a few years later, the first Arab-Israeli war would break out in 1948, and Israel would be able to establish itself by 1948. Big shocker here, but the defeat of the Arab nations against Israel would send shockwaves across the region. Azam, like many Arabs, would see the defeat as a loss of Arab land and prestige. Azam as a Muslim would see this as non-Muslim occupation of the Holy Lands, and later on in his life he would view this as a point of conflict between Muslims and non-Muslims. But I think it's also very important to state, Azam as a Palestinian would see the defeat as a loss of personal Palestinian land and honor. Azam personally and literally saw the Jezreel Valley Plain, a place his family had worked on for years, be handed over to Israeli settlers, while his village Al Silah Al Harathiyah would become a border village to Israel. And no surprise here, the new Arab-Israeli border would see many Arab-Israeli border skirmishes between, no surprise here, Arabs and Israelis. And Azam would see this during his childhood. On top of that, you also had the Nakba, where Palestinians were displaced by the fighting in or the following Israeli operations that forced out Palestinians. Azam's own family would end up opening their doors to a displaced Palestinian family and help them get back on their feet. Azam as a child during this time would also come into contact with Islamist fighters from neighboring Arab states recruited by the Muslim Brotherhood. This would be Azam's first introduction to pan-Islamism in a physical form. I think it's pretty safe to say that these events would greatly influence a young child like Azam. But even with these events of warfare and displacements and all that type of stuff, Azam would still be what people would call a bookworm and after middle school he'd go into the Oh god, I'm going to mispronounce a word and I know for a fact the audience is not expecting me to mispronounce this word. The Kaduri Agricultural School. Yeah, I have struggles saying this word. Some of you may be asking, why did he go to a agricultural school instead of like a high school? Well, that's because the farming business was for sure going to make Azam money. And on top of that, did you guys know that Azam came from a farming family? So that probably played into it too. And even though Azam's life was picking up and he's going to school and things of that sort, Azam's religiousness did not go away. And during his time at the Kaduri Agricultural School, Azam would work at becoming a Hafiz of Qur'an. Now for those that don't know what a Hafiz of Qur'an is, a Hafiz of Qur'an is someone that has studied the Qur'an word for word, cover to cover, I would say book to book, but from what I know there's only one book. I should also state that in many places within the Muslim world, becoming a Hafiz of Qur'an is a very respectable thing. And after Azam would finish his studies at the Kaduri Agricultural School, Azam would be sent off to Jordan where he would work as a teacher for a year and then he would return back to Palestine in 1961 where he would then again work as a teacher teaching Islamic studies but also teaching in agriculture and he would also work as an agricultural supervisor. But even with Azam's life still picking up, i.e. leaving school and going into work, Azam would still try to dive deeper into his religion, trying to get a higher education in Islamic studies, especially on Islamic law. This should be my disclaimer that there is not one form of Islamic law, you know there's different jurisprudence and things of that sort. Azam would study in Damascus, Syria, but work in the West Bank. This would become a recurring theme in Azam's life where he would go around the world to either spread his cause or learn more about his cause. Now Azam's studies 
in Damascus, Syria would also put him into contact with many Muslim Brotherhood members and supporters within Syria. I mean Syria by the late 1960s was on the verge of a Muslim Brotherhood uprising. That being said, Azam himself did not participate in any of that violence. Most of the violence was up north in the cities of Hama and Aleppo, and Damascus is pretty down south. On top of that, Azam had work to do in Jordan and the West Bank. And during this general time frame, Azam would finally get married to Samira Abdullah Awatila. Abdullah Azam and Samira Abdullah Awatila would end up having a daughter named Fatima a year after their marriage in 1966, with them having another daughter in 1967 named Wafa. Abdullah Azam and Samira Abdullah Awatila would end up having six more children throughout their life, and Azam would also graduate from Damascus University in 1967. Azam was now a family man, a teacher, he also did work for the Muslim Brotherhood in the city of Janin, and also gained higher Islamic education, something that he was aiming for. Azam during this time frame would also begin to bump heads and later on form a strong hatred of Arab nationalists and leftists. Within Azam's own personal life, he would see a pro nasserid person tear up holy books at a Muslim Brotherhood event, and no surprise here, that would rub Abdullah Azam the wrong way. While in Egypt, Arab nationalist Gamal Abdel Nasser would lead a brutal crackdown against the Muslim Brotherhood. And in 1966, influential Islamist writer and thinker Syed Qutb would be executed by the new Nasser government. And while Azam during this time frame would be considered somewhat late in reading Qutb's works and writings, Azam would find Qutb as an intellectual inspiration. I mean, Azam later on in his life and his works were heavily, and I'm for sure Abdullah Azam would happily accept, be heavily influenced by Qutb's thought, and Azam would call for people to read Qutb's work. So when Abdullah Azam heard about the execution of Syed Qutb, Abdullah Azam got pretty mad. Now I should stress the apparently part, Abdullah Azam was so enraged by Syed Qutb's death that he wrote a letter to Gamal Abdel Nasser condemning and threatening the man. The only reason Azam didn't get in trouble with any government authorities, that being the Jordanian or the Egyptian authorities, was because the mailman that he gave the mail to was his friend and returned the letter, telling Azam off and especially telling him not to put his real name on the letter. Azam would then send a second letter under a fake name, and it's unknown if this letter actually made it to Azam, but I think it shows a conviction that Abdullah Azam had. And a less apparently story, Abdullah Azam would actually get almost into I think a physical fight with another teacher who was celebrating the death of Said Qutb and people had to calm down Abdullah Azam. I think I should remind people of something that is very important and that fact is that, there's a lot of that in this sentence, is that Abdullah Azam was born, raised and now lived in Palestine in about 1967. You know what else happened in 1967? The Six Day War between Arab neighboring states and Israel where Israel would defeat the neighboring Arab states in about six days, less than a week, and went from this to this. And during his time where Azam lived, would now fall under Israeli occupation. Abdullah Azam would leave the West Bank not wanting to live under Israeli Jewish occupation. Some of you might have realized that I stress the words Israeli Jewish occupation. Well, that's because there's a lot of layers to this for Azam. Number one, Azam does not like the state of Israel. Number two, and I'm willing to bet, Azam did not want to live under non-Muslim rule, hence the Israeli but also Jewish occupation. But Azam wasn't a one-off case. During his time, there was a lot of uncertainty about what would happen to Palestinians under Israeli occupation. And I mean, all you have to do is just turn on the news. Azam, until his death, would want to return to Palestine to fight and get rid of Israel. No surprise here, but when Azam and his family left the West Bank, this would become a huge turning point in Azam's life until he died, as he would never step foot back in his homeland, Palestine, once again. I mean, if you want to get all technical, he might have like took a step over the border, but for the most part, he was not able to live in Palestine once again. Azam was not a one-off case, as many Palestinians would also leave Israeli-occupied territory to neighboring Arab states. Azam, like many Palestinians, would go off to live in Jordan. Azam would then join the local Muslim Brotherhood chapter in Jordan, trying to help build them up. And by 1969, Azam was fighting with the Palestinian Fedayeen. And while the Fedayeen are famous for being armed leftist and Arab nationalist groups that fought against Israel, there were also small Islamist groups within them. Now the Muslim Brotherhood Fedayeen began to gain momentum after the Arab failures of the Six Day War. 
many Islamists began to view Arab nationalist governments as incompetent against Israel. And no surprise here, many of these young guys of course wanted to blow off steam per se, and all they had to do was get a gun and go up north, or east, or south. And after much internal debate, the Muslim Brotherhood would form an agreement with the Fatah group where they would fight against Israel, but only if they were under the Fatah flag and Fatah leadership. That being said, these Muslim Brotherhood camps were given massive autonomy from the Fatah leadership. It seems like Fatah said, you want to shoot at Israel? Sure, go wild kids, I don't care what you do. And Abdullah Azam would end up becoming a leader for one of these Islamist Fedayeen camps. Or Abdullah Azam would train new recruits and he would also give ideological lectures to fighters at the camps but also civilians who were around the camp when he was off duty. Azam would try to convince many people to participate in what he viewed as a jihad against Israel. And if you die, well you got martyrdom, so it's victory or martyrdom. On top of that, Azam's previously stated Islamic studies education also made him a religious authority within the camp. And on top of that, Azam would lead raids against the Israeli military, which would also make him a military authority. But even with these Islamist Fedayeen camps doing military actions against Israel, I should state that the Muslim Brotherhood Fedayeen fighters weren't that militarily significant. The leftist and Arab nationalist factions were already doing except replace all their religious talk and jihad talk with international revolutionary struggle against the capitalist system. No surprise here, but the Islamists and the leftists did not enjoy each other's company, and while these groups did not end up shooting at each other, they for sure denounced, talked against, straight up traded insults, and at times stole from each other. Azam himself would even end up getting in trouble with a PLO military tribunal at one point. But Azam would talk his way out because Azam is also a very charismatic person. Do you guys know who else got in trouble with a massive military? The many Fedayeen groups based in Jordan, as the relationship between these groups and the Jordanian government would begin to sour. The many Fedayeen groups were kicked out of Jordan during the Black September events aka the Jordanian Civil War. The Muslim Brotherhood Fedayeen were able to avoid most of the bloodshed as they didn't pick a side within this conflict. They would view this conflict as Muslims fighting Muslims and would not want to participate in it. Even with this neutral stance, the Muslim Brotherhood Fedayeen were later on crushed by the Jordanian government too. Azam during his time would begin to view the Middle East with a lot of pessimism. Disenfranchised with the leftist Fedayeen and Arab nationalist governments and their inability towards fighting Israel. Azam would end up getting an educational job in Jordan where he would return to civilian life. Azam would even end up going to Cairo where he would study in Al Ahzar, the very famous Al Ahzar University in 1971 with a scholarship from the Jordanian government. During this time, the Egyptian government, now under Anwar Sadat, would also begin to ease its relationship with the Islamists within Egypt. And while the ban on the Muslim Brotherhood was never lifted, Anwar Sadat would release previously arrested Muslim Brotherhood members under Nasser's rule. While the Muslim Brotherhood would also begin to see a internal change. Folks within the Muslim Brotherhood would begin to feel that they didn't need to overthrow the government, but could Islamize the government peacefully and from within. This isn't to say that all Muslim Brotherhood members and supporters adopted this moderate approach. And you would see a split where what I'll be calling more hardline groups, who were much more open to direct action to opposing the secular Egyptian government that they viewed as un-Islamic and illegitimate. And these factions were mostly inspired by Syed Qutb's work. You then even had more extreme factions than the previously stated hardline factions, factions like the Jamaat al-Muslimin aka Takfir al-Hijra that took armed action against the Egyptian government and would takfir Muslims that opposed them but it would also takfir Muslims that worked within the Egyptian government. Now for those that don't know, takfiring within the religion of Islam, I guess you could say is like excommunicating someone from the faith. Now you also have their discussions within Islamic jurisprudence and the ulama and all of that stuff about who can be takfeared and what is a takfirable offense. But for a rule of thumb, what I'll be calling extremist takfiri factions, so I feel like calling a group a takfiri faction is not a proper analogy, but it's the analogy that I think it's easy to grasp on. So, but back to the rule of thumb. These takfiri groups view themselves on the true interpretation of Islam, Quran, and Hadith. And if you disagree with them, especially on a ideological premises, but in some cases not join their group, then you are opposing the correct interpretation of Islam, Quran, and Sunnah, and you cannot be takfeared. Heck, in some cases, if you don't takfear people they takfear, then you get takfeared. 
I should state I am not a religious authority within the religion of Islam and there are still many nuances within the topic of takfiring. So don't use this video as your deep understanding of takfiring within Islam. Go ask a Islamic scholar or something bro. Don't ask a YouTube guy. While in Cairo, Abdullah Azam would also notice the deep internal discord between these Egyptian Islamist factions. And funny enough, Azam himself would be takfired during his time in Cairo by a follower of Shukri Mustafa because Abdullah Azam would follow the Muslim Brotherhood viewpoint and the Muslim Brotherhood viewpoint did not takfir folks that Mustafa had takfired, hence they could be takfired. During Azam's time in Al-Ahzar University, he would study a lot about Usal al-Fiqh which is just understanding the jurisprudence of Islamic law. And Abdullah Azam would even finish his doctorate and a 600 page thesis in about 16 months. And from what I heard, it usually takes 3-5 to five years to finish those things. Azam would even pass with the highest grade possible. No surprise here, Abdullah Azam would form a lot of connections with the Muslim Brotherhood. He's in Egypt where the Muslim Brotherhood was made. Abdullah Azam would even make connections with Muhammad Qutb who was Said Qutb's brother. And while in Egypt, Azam would also consolidate his Qutbist thoughts and viewpoints. Or Azam would wound up takfiring secular leftists and Arab nationalists. By 1973, Azam would return to Jordan where he took a job as a lecturer in the Sharia department at the University of Jordan. And from what I read, was pretty damn good at his job, being loved by the students there. No surprise here, Azam's lectures at the university had many Islamist and political tones. And Azam during this time would help raise awareness and support for Islamist ideas and viewpoints, especially with the Palestinian and Jordanian youth there. Azam would also hold lectures and give support to the Muslim Brotherhood across Jordan during this time. And by most to all accounts that I'm reading of, Azam cared a lot about his educational work. So much so that at times he somewhat put his family behind his work. And I'm not trying to be like all rude and poke at someone. Now I am not saying that Abdullah Azam did not have a family life. Abdullah Azam did have a family life. He loved his children, he loved his wife. And whenever he had free time, he would spend his time with his family. That being said, Abdullah Azam's family at times had to learn how to work independent without Azam. And his family also had to sacrifice a lot for Azam's what we could somewhat call expensive lifestyle. Trying to get higher education and moving around multiple countries cost a lot of money. And we can't even forget that Azam fought with the Fedayeen and his family would have to live nearby the camp. On top of that, and this becomes a reoccurring theme, Azam at times did not know when to, uh, I guess, what we would say separate his personal life and his job. Azam would kind of view his work as, you know, working in the name of God, so everything comes for God first. But back to Azam. Azam during his time did not like the Jordanian government too. Azam would view the Jordanian government as a un-Islamic government. Azam would also become a very respected teacher, some could argue politician for the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, and would even begin to do international trips around the world. I should state the following story I'm about to say is disputed, but no bullcrap, the story I'm about to say in my opinion seems like the most likely and realistic story. And this story is where Abdullah Azam would first meet a young Osama bin Laden in 1978. Now where did Azam meet young bin Laden? Well he met him in America, in the state of Indiana, in the city of Indianapolis. It's a small world we live in huh? But apparently Osama bin Laden doesn't remember this but one of bin Laden's wife remembers this, hence the disputes among the story. Now something very big and important would happen in the following year. And if you're a long time subscriber and you just heard the words 1979, I did not like narrow it down for you at all. But that would be the Iranian revolution, where the western backed secular Shah was overthrown and was replaced by Islamist Islamic Republic led by Ayatollah Khomeini. Azam initially was energetic and even supported the Islamic Republic and Khomeini. Heck, Azam would even lose his job after threatening a newspaper that mocked Iranian mullahs as American agents. Later on in Azam's life, he would view Iran and Khomeini as misguided and being like any other government in the region. But at the time, during the initial start of the Iranian revolution slash the Islamic revolution, Azam was supportive of it. And Azam was now gaining the attention of the Jordanian government. 
Azam held more political lectures inside and outside the classroom, and even began to organize protests against the Jordanian government. As I should stress once again, Azam saw the Jordanian government an Islamic, and, and Azam also felt that there was a secret relationship between Israel and the Jordanian government. And this would catch the attention of the Jordanian government. No surprise here, Azam was very likely forced out of or heavily swayed to leave Jordan by the Jordanian government. And during this time, Abdullah Azam would be coming into conflict with the local Muslim Brotherhood chapter there. And from the reading I did, the disputes with the Muslim Brotherhood seems like pity stuff that people just didn't like Azam. In the end, Azam would leave Jordan and he would move to Mecca in 1980 to work at the King Abdulaziz University's Sharia department. Azam was now in Mecca, the heart of the Muslim world, and Mecca was the Mecca for Muslims and Islamic thought. And Azam during this time would begin to bump into more Islamists from around the whole Muslim world. Now, pan-Islamism is the idea that Muslims around the world should unite under one political entity, mostly under some form of Sharia law. And any form of division you could think of, whether in race or ethnic or nationalities, in theory would not matter to a pan-Islamist. Very famously, the last sermon of the Prophet Muhammad talked about how all Muslims are brothers and sisters, which is now leading me to an off-topic rant, which is why are all these so-called based online Muslim guys aligning themselves with ethno-nationalists? I mean, have you guys not seen what happened to people who align themselves with ethno-nationalists? Plus, shouldn't this and this already be changing your minds? But back to the video. So for pan-Islamists and the pan-Islamism viewpoint, being Muslims and the religion of Islam is the uniting factor for the Ummah. Now for those that don't know, no surprise here, Islamist groups also hold a pan-Islamist viewpoint, but the execution of how to do the Islamization of the Muslim world differs group to group. And especially during this time, Islamist groups were working independent of each other, mostly divided by nations or regional branches, you guys get the point. And this is where Azam would bump into a more what I'm going to somewhat call a universal form of pan-Islamism. Now why am I using the term universal pan-Islamism? Well that's because while many Islamist groups were working independent of each other, and of their regional branches at time, this new what I'm calling universal pan-Islamism approach said freak all of that noise and if a Muslim from a certain part of the world needs help then you should help them whether or not they're a part of your group or your national branch or your nation. Azam would fall in love with this idea and this is what we could call a huge turning point in history, specifically armed Islamist history. Now I should also point out that there are many forms of pan-Islamist action. The most famous form of pan-Islamist action is terrorism, or you could call it armed struggle, or I don't care what you call it, guns and people dying is involved. But there are also other forms of pan-Islamism activities. Some could be medical work, a Muslim guy wants to go to another Muslim country to help his Muslim brothers who need medical work. Another thing could be charity, people are doing a charity run or giving charity to a Muslim group or groups of Muslims because they're Muslim. Though I should state a good amount of charity, especially in the next part of this video, just ended up being charities for our Islamist movements, but charity does count and it isn't inherently violent. Another form of pan-Islamism could be teaching or sharing of academic ideas. I'm for sure you guys are getting the memo of what I'm trying to say. Pan-Islamist actions and activities very, but clearly we should know what this video series is about. So let me return back to the very armed political Islamist side of pan-Islamism. During this time, Azam would end up meeting Osama bin Laden for the second time, or the first time depending on who you ask. Azam while in Mecca would also meet up with Afghan Mujahideen leader Abdul Rab al Rasul Saif. Abdullah Azam within Saudi Arabia would begin to itch for a jihad. Aha, play on words. Aha. And Azam would have two options during this time Yemen or Afghanistan. Yemen at this time was having a conflict, and Afghanistan at this time was having a conflict. Azam would end up going to Yemen for a quick minute, but didn't make his decision there. Azam would end up being convinced by Kamal al Sanari to only teach one semester in Mecca before moving out to Pakistan in 1981. Some of you may be asking, why was Azam so quick to jump ship from Mecca? The Mecca of Muslims and Islamic thoughts. But well, that's because Abdullah Azam and his family would feel alienated within Saudi Arabia 
and Azam's new ideological viewpoints pushed him along with Kamal al Sanari. Abdullah Azam would end up only teaching one semester in Mecca before moving off to Pakistan in 1981. Some of you might have forgot something. You can't just go up and quit your previous life to move to a different country without having questions being raised. One huge question would be, how would the King Abdulaziz University react to one of his teachers quitting and just leaving the country? Why would this highly respected and educated sheikh jump ships? On top of that, Azam signed the contract and he had to continue working at the university. Well, Azam would simply say this, I am moving to Pakistan to teach Islam and Arabic to fellow Pakistani Muslim brothers. To which the university said, sure. And while moving to Pakistan in 1981, is a pretty big thing in Azam's life. Azam also had other things to do. Azam was a writer. Before he went to Afghanistan, he was already writing political books. And this is where Azam would begin to express his political opinions and viewpoints in a written form. Now Abdullah Azam wrote multiple books, so I'm going to just give a general summary of his ideas and not the deep details of certain books and things of that sort. This should be my content warning and also where I'm probably not going to get monetized. I might get monetized. I don't know. I'm going to run the gauntlet. We're going to find out all together. This should be my content warning. There is like a lot of conspiracy theories within the next section of this video. Especially when Abdullah Azam is talking about non-Muslims in general, but Jews in particular. There is a lot of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and tropes within his writings. Abdullah Azam tended to view the world as the good Muslims versus the horde of non-Muslims and their plots against the Muslims and Islam. Azam would argue and assert some of the reasons why the Muslim world and the Middle East is unstable. One reason was because of European colonialism. This colonialism would make the Muslim world receptive to Western secular liberal ideas and nationalism that Azam felt was being enforced by the Christians, the West, and the Jews. Uh, Azam would also say that the secular nationalist ideas, along with the nation state within the Middle East, were formed to fragment the Muslim world against each other instead of uniting them. Azam within the book would also end up takfiring nationalist Muslim leaders, and Azam would also view many Islamic religious institutions as either being passive to a oppressive government or in some cases becoming the arm for that oppressive government. Azam also felt that the Middle East was dealing with the aftermath of European colonialism and the destruction of the Ottoman Caliphate. I should state Azam is what I'll be calling a Autobot, or someone that greatly loves the Ottoman Empire. Have you guys ever gone into a Pakistani Turkish comment section? That is a form of an Autobot. Within his writings, Azam is even critical of Islamic revivalists like Jalal al-Din al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdu, and Abdul Rahman Kawakibi because they were critical of the Ottoman Empire in one way or another. Now here comes a very big part. Now I should stress, not me. Azam also claimed that communism was a Jewish funded and led plot to destroy mankind in general and Islam in particular. Azam also felt that Jewish people took down the Ottoman Empire and brought chaos to the Muslim world. Azam really dislikes communism and Jews and I mean Jews not like using the term Israelis and Jews interchangeably, no I mean Jews as in Jews. It should be stated that during this time a lot of big things were happening in the Middle East. Many Arab and Muslim governments were leading crackdowns against Islamist elements within their countries. So that probably reinforced Azam and also people who read his books, Conclusions. The Arab-Israeli conflict, no surprise here, greatly influenced the Palestinian-born Abdullah Azam. His constant conflict with leftist Fidayeen and the incompetence of Arab nations to fight Israel, along with El Ahsar University standing by as Anwar Sadat signed the 1979 peace treaty with Israel, most likely influenced Abdullah Azam. Within Azam's viewpoint, a caliphate under Sharia law would improve the situation of the Muslim world. I should state that this viewpoint wasn't a Azam-only viewpoint. I don't want to give people the impression that Azam came up with all of these viewpoints and theories. Many Islamists at that time, and heck, many Islamists until today, still hold, in some cases, all or some of these viewpoints. And I think these viewpoints are the default viewpoints of groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, especially the whole global plot by atheists and depending on who you ask, Jews or atheist Jews or atheist communists or atheist communist Jews. You guys get the whole point along with secular Muslims and nationalist leaders and leftist Muslims and Christians are leading a plot against the Muslim world. And in November 1981, Abdullah Azam, along with his family, would step off a plane and were now in the city of Islamabad. 
Azam was now a representative of the Islamic University of Islamabad, but clearly fighting was just across the border in Afghanistan, where his real intentions rested, where Afghan Mujahideen fighters were fighting against the Soviet army. I'm lost.